Ladies and gentlemen, hello again to everybody out there in front of the screens. I'm really happy to welcome you again in our masterclass series to our today's webinar, Digital Holstein Farm Tours, Her Genotyping and Beef on Dairy. So this is again a very interesting topic uh, that we prepared for you. And as I promised last time, Many of you probably I saw three weeks ago during our masterclass bull parade and award ceremony and I promised due to the special COVID times with, that we have right now, we try to shorten the time until we meet again in presence. So this year is another special event for you prepared and uh, I hope you, you will uh, like what we prepared for you. So our um, topic of today is the digital Holstein farm tour. And maybe you don't know why we came to this topic. This is quite easy because um, as we couldn't prepare Holstein, uh, as we couldn't prepare Schauder Besten this year as usual, we um, thought a little bit what you like during Schauder Besten most. And what we know from the um, tours we planned for you there is that you really like the farm tours. So we thought about preparing this in a digital format and here we are today. Um, we visited a farm very close to Ferden, more or less one hour away from here. Uh, we went to the Wedemark area, to the Schüttenhof and Plumhof and um, yeah, we are quite happy that we could convince the family Backhaus to open their farm doors for us so that we have an overview there and um, yeah, to have an introduction to their uh, management and so on. And with me here today is um, the jun junior manager, uh, Luisa Backhaus. And yeah, she will lead us through the farm and show uh, how it is set up and how it developed during the last years. As a second part of our uh, masterclass today, um, our colleague Jan Gebhardt um, will introduce to us a little bit the more theoretical part uh, of the herd genotyping. Uh, including also the comparison of genotype and phenotype. And I think you will also appreciate that as we took out some examples from the farm to make it also more practicable and visible for you. Before we get started, um, you may assume uh, that I'm not alone here. Um, we are here in the premises of uh, Master and Head Office in Ferden and in the background, you know it's always a team to make things successfully. So Timo is again part of our a technical background group and Diana Walter, she's in the chat room and um, answering your questions there. So I will pass the questions also to Luisa and to Jan and um, yeah, feel free to use this chat function. And um, we will now as a, Jan, you already know this if you, um, joined our master classes before we will try out the chat. So please move with your mouse to the edge of the screen and then you can open uh, a window and um, answer the question that we will um, give to you right now. The question is the following. I will have to look it up because I, rem I don't remember it anymore. <laughs> uh, what is the most interesting part for you if you would join a farm tour? So please. Uh, Give us a kind of overview what you like most in farm tours and answer uh, the question so that we also know that uh, you are successfully or can successfully using the chat. The cows, all right. <laughs> and the cow sires, very good. Calves. Okay, so I'm quite convinced that the chat, that the chat is working. I think the one little thing is missed <laughs> during my speech. I, I didn't introduce myself. So my name is Almut Averbeck. I'm the division manager here for international sales at Masterland. And I will lead you through our program for the next, I assume, 75 minutes of today. And yeah, I think uh, we can get started. Before Luisa goes into the topic, if you are interested to see a typical German modern farm, and if you want to know what are the advantages of her genotyping, this is now the best occasion. Please go ahead, um, 
please join um, what Luisa wants to tell us about her farm. Um, she is a very competent union manager. She is young, she's enthusiastic. She has a very clear uh, view of uh, her future farm. She has passion for what she's doing and convinced herself. So Lisa, now it's your stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Almut. Now the pressure is on. Um, my name is Lisa Backhaus. I'd like to welcome all of you in front of your computers. And I'd like to present you our family farm. We are located in the north of Germany in Lower Saxony close to Hanover. And first of all, I'd like to thank my team back home because what was quite untypical for us was that we had about 10 centimeters of snow and really cold weather, about minus 20 degrees, two days prior to filming and taking photographs on our farm. So without them, it wouldn't have been possible to make this uh, farm tour. And yeah, the team is also responsible for all the good numbers that we achieved in the last few years and all the de development that we went through. Here you can see a little overview. So we milk about 600, or we have about 600 cows at the moment with uh, a little bit over 12,000 uh, kilogram milk last year. And you can see the fat and the protein as well. We are a team about 20 employees. 10 of them are full-time workers and the other half is part-time or we call it mini jobbers. They are mostly students or, or pupil and they um, study, for example, agriculture or to be veterinarians. And they come to our farm to get some uh, hands-on education as well. For producing the feed for our cows, we have about 400 hectares of arable land. Uh, most of the crops we grow are, of course, grass and corn, which we harvest in silage. We are able to do about four to five cuts of grass per year, depends on the weather. But the last three years have been very, very dry in Germany. So we were just able to do two to three cuts and we have to irrigate a lot because otherwise there would no growing at all. A question? Lisa, there's already the first question coming in. Uh, if you do two or three times milking. Uh, we do two and a half actually. And I will explain that later on in my presentation if that's okay for everybody. So I think that's quite a special part on our farm. Uh, and I think we just started two and a half times milking uh, close to a year ago. So maybe, or I, I'm pretty sure our numbers will go up. In the last milking control, we were at about 12,700 liters. So we're aiming for 13,000 liters this year. See if we can do it. Um, close to or next to our cow shed, we have a biogas station. So the manure goes underground in there. And that is quite an important part for farms in Germany to get accepted because we have a big discussion in Germany whether agriculture is okay or not okay and how farmers should uh, behave to be okay with the environment. So that is something people on our farm and visitors uh, like and think is good and to be accepted in the, in the community. We also have solar panels on our uh, cow barns. You can see that in the short introduction video that we filmed at the end of February and I'd like to show that to you now. So maybe we uh, answer the questions that are coming in right now a little later about insemination also the usage of semen.
Yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Now I'd like to start with my little farm tour and we start in our milking barn. The first part was built about 10 years ago. And that was when we decided that we want to have our cows in a new and modern barn. They were still on the old farm, which is next to the new farm. And the boxes were too small. There was not enough space and it was really dark in the stables. So we decided to build a new one and we build a new milking parlor next to it. And we had our dry cows on the old farm. So just the milking cows in the new barn, which is a classical free stall barn. And the dry cows, which obviously need the most space, the most comfort were in the old barn. And we figured that was not uh, a good solution. So about six years later, we started to um, build on the shed and extend it. And because we visited a lot of farms ahead, we knew that we don't want the classical three row barn anymore. And we, but we wanted to have straight lines for working. So just one line for uh, feeding, one a row for the cows to walk. So we put an extra feed trough, which you cannot see that good on the outside of uh, the barn. So we have one stall, which is ju just a two stall barn and one which has just one row of beds for the cows. And in the one with just one row and one um, place for feeding, we have our very fresh cows. So the ones up to 30 days in milking. So we can check if they have a fresh and good start and if they increase in milk yields and if they are healthy. And after that, our high milking cows, which means they are over 50 liters, they go in the two stall barn and the other ones go in a three row, a three stall barn. And we keep our heifers separately the whole time. So as soon as they go in the milking herd, they have their own group and they stay there for the whole lactation. And when we started doing that, about 10 years ago, all the heifers went up about two kilogram per day in milk. And we never want to go back because we can make the beds a little bit smaller and adjust um, all the comfort stuff for these animals. And that really, really improves their health and their milk yields. Uh, we, uh, our family always likes to visit other farms. Uh, especially in other countries. And so my parents went to Canada when we were building the new barn and they saw that fans were everywhere. And even though it's not that hot in Germany most of the time, in the summer it can get really hot. So we put in fans and we learned that in the last two summers when it was really hot, way above 30 degrees and it didn't cool down at night that the fans really helped our cows to stay high in milk yields and have good pregnancy rates. And we even think of putting in more fans and maybe some solutions with water for the future, depending on how good our milk price is going to be and how hot the summer is going to be. We have a solid concrete floor and some scrapers, which you can see on the picture and they go straight into just one underground row and that goes straight into the biogas. So all the people who come to our farm see that we don't have lots of gas going in the atmosphere, which is a big, big, big discussion in Germany, but goes in the biogas and is producing electricity and warmth and at the end, uh, nutrition for our fields as well. We have about seven households connected to our biogas station as well, and they get the heat from the biogas station. Here you can see our dry cow barn, which is right behind the parlor. So all the cows get, can go through our foot bath that we have integrated in the parlor every two weeks, um, which we do regularly. So one week we have hoof trimming and the other week we do have foot bath for the whole herd and the dry cows go through it as well. We have two groups of dry cows, uh, far off and close up. 
but at the moment we just feed one ration for all of them. Uh, we do that because uh, it's easier for us in the workflow. And as you can see on the foil, we do dry them off. Uh, the first, uh, first calf cow is 60 days prior to calving, so quite early. And the cows which had more calves, we even dry off 50 days prior to calving. And since we, we are doing that, which is about a year, we get a higher quality of colostrum for our calves. And we always test that because for us, it's really important for the calves to have a really good start in their lives. From our dry cow barn, which is a classical um, two row barn, uh, it goes straight into the calving area and one person can handle it. You can see our calving area here. It's a straw barn and we don't do just in time calving because we are not in the stable the whole time. We're still a family farm and we are not in the stable from nine o'clock at night to three o'clock in the morning. So at this time we can control our cows. And so we put them in the straw about a week prior to calving, depending on the calving date and if we can see that they are going into calving. Here you see our calf housing. Um, when a calf is born, we all weight them. So we know how much they uh, birth weight they had and they all get four liters of tested colostrum. We really aim for high quality there. So if it's not good enough, it just goes in the rest of the calves because we uh, feed whole milk the whole time and uh, we pasteurize it and we put acid in there for the calves so it doesn't get bad. Our female calves get in single hutches for three weeks. All calves get an iron, iron and insulin injection when they are born. And the female calves in their single housing stay for about three weeks. And after the fourth calf of one group is three weeks old, they go in a group hutch where all four cows, uh, four calves stay for at least 10 weeks, which is the earliest when we wean them. But the important point for us is that they take two kilogram of muesli per calf per day. And if that takes 12 weeks, then they get milk 12 weeks. In the first three weeks, we do a semi at libitum feeding. So up to 12 liters per calf per day. Uh, but most of the Holsteinking calves don't drink much more than that. Here you can see our heifer barn. So after the first four months where they are on straw the whole time and just in their small groups, they go in this bigger barn and there are bigger groups as well. And we try to teach them to lay down in their boxes and have the normal classical barn, which is for the grown up cows as well. And we had uh, just a concrete uh, underground for laying down up to two or three years ago. And then we installed a big and soft mattress. So they lay down better and they stay cleaner. And once a week we put uh, wood shavings on there as well to increase the comfort. They stay in this barn up to when they are eight months old. And then they go on two different farms where they go for all the raising time. And they come back to our farm when they are about two months close to calving. Our milking routine, as I promised. Uh, we milk in a double 16 side by side from Bumedic. We really like that parlor. And we have a milking frequency of two and a half times per day, which is probably quite special, but we do that because we are still a family farm and even though we have uh, employees from which are not from our family, we want to have good working hours for them and family friendly working hours as far as that is possible. So we start with the first milking at 3 a.m. in the morning 
which is one shift, and we milk all the cows there. And then eight hours later at 11 a.m., we start again and we just milk half of the herd. Uh, this is the fresh cows up to 30 days, the high lactating uh, cow, cows with more calves, which means they have at least 70, uh, 47 liters, more close to 50 and all the heifers we met three times a day. And since we did that, we just uh, worked it out yesterday. Uh, the heifers increased at about six liters per day. So that's crazy what three times milking improves in this part. We have a front exit so they can go out of the parlor pretty fast. And all the machinery, which is quite loud, is underground. So while milking, it's really quiet and we always have the radio on and the oldest milker can decide which music. So you can imagine sometimes it's more the classical stuff and sometimes it's a little bit more hip hop like. We have an underfloor heating in our pile as well, which is quite nice for the winter time. The feeding. This is not my major subject. My sister, which is not working on our farm, but working for a company who's calculating rations, is calculating our ration. And my boyfriend is uh, measuring the dry matter intake, the dry, um, the dry matter of the silages once per week, and controlling if the feeding is done correctly. We have a self-propelled mixing wagon for four or five years now, and we feed about five rations. You can see here what we put in there. So just one ration for our dry cows, and we differ between high producing cows and high producing first calf cows. But the biggest difference is just that we put alfalfa high hay silage in there instead of straw and that we have a higher concentration of energy for the young cows. We feed twice a day and we push the feed six times a day. That is one of the goals for the future to increase our pushing times so that they can take in even a little bit more feed. Herd management. That is what my father and me are doing. We both love cows very much, so we split it a bit between him and me. Uh, me. He is responsible for all the hoof trimming parts, for the reproduction and the breeding. And he's really, really a cow guy. So he knows all our cow families and knows what the grandmother had done and how they bred and is into all that stuff. And I'm responsible for all the fresh cows for the herd health in general and for all the numbers that we collect and then we have to look it up and see where we can improve and where we can get better. Once a month we check on our health status which we just compare to ourselves so um, we look at that and we do master and benchmarking which is a group of four farms for one year and we go to one farm every three months and we check all the numbers about other, other, other health, milk production, reproduction, longevity. Uh, yeah, I think these are the four topics and we have a walk around our farm or the farm where we're on and see where they can get better. And that's always really, really nice because you get an, another view on your farm and you get tips to get better. We want to start, with, this is something for the future, we're going to do it this year, um, to calculate our income over feed cost more regularly. We just do that when we calculate a new ration at the moment, but we want to do it weekly. Yeah, you can see some of our um, herd management numbers like our milk production or our reproduction numbers on the slide. Our first calving age, we want to have a little bit lower. We aim for 23 and a half, maybe 24 months, uh, but we have to be a little bit better in the raising time there and especially on 
from our raising farms. That is quite a competition for the future. Hey, Luisa, that was a really excellent start to present uh, your farm to us. I see that there are a lot of questions coming in and I know that you will have a second part of uh, introducing us to your to your farm and letting us know a little bit more about some insemination strategy and so on and so on. But in the meanwhile, let me pass over the pointer to uh, our colleague Jan Gappert. Um, he is a young member of our international team and he will now lead us through the herd genotyping details. Jan, it's your stage. Yeah, hello everybody from my side. Um, no, uh, some one of you might already know me. Um, yeah, I am working for the Marsrins since around six months. Um, before I studied with the um, sister of Louisa uh, in Göttingen, um, agriculture for yeah, five years. And yeah, now I'm part of the Marsrin family since yeah, six months, I already said. And yeah, normally that's, um, yeah, Diana's part, her genotyping. Um, today, I get the pleasure to um, yeah, give you some details about the her genotyping on uh, yeah in Germany on the Backhaus farm, and yeah, let's see what we get. Um, so, first, basic: what is her genotyping? Uh, her genotyping is the testing of all female calves on a farm um, with an ear tech sample. So through that, you will get the possibility um, for genomic selection early in the age of the calves. So around nearly a month or later, depends when you take the ear tags and when you send them to the VAT uh, or to us. Um, the benefits for you. The benefits to herd genotyping you gain, uh, you optimize your farm growth. So you definitely just grow the half as you need, not more and not less, and you, you are selecting the right animals. So furthermore, the parentage safety, you, are, you know the father or the sire of your calves is def definitely the right one. There's no guess, no opportunity to be wrong. And after that, the advance of the health health, you can select through all outside health, and it will be part of our um, RCG in the future. So. You can select through our RCG and our um, program the, the right cow and the right sire for your calves that you get the uh, health advantage on your farm. Um, through all of that, you will maximize um, the breeding progress and the money you earn on your farm. You improve your economic output. And now you get through all of that, the precise breeding, you know, which, uh, which sire you need for the calves and the heifers you are breeding right now or on the cows. And you can select, do you want to breed an older cow that's not such a good in the um, production to beef, yeah, to beef or to sex team maybe. Um, furthermore, we have, will have um, some examples for you as well. Um, yeah, but first, um, which information do you will get through her genotyping? Um, you will get comprehensive in information about all the breeding values and genetic traits for all tested animals. So you will know about the haplotypes or any genetic defects of the heifers. You will know everything about what will be the, my cow in the future. What is the difference of the cow in milk production to the average of the whole um, yeah, sample? of the whole data sample we have in Germany. And yeah, here's a small overview about all the data on the top. You can see um, the name, the breed, the sex, um, the original name, the birth of the calf, and who is the owner right now, um, the pedigree below that. So th here we have a Salvatore daughter out of a captain. Um, yes, you see it's a calf um, yeah, out of the US. And below that, uh, on the left hand, you have the part and the total merit indexes. Um, first, the RCG, um, the three, three father PI, the, um, the straight breeding value, and on the right, the, the G, um, that V, that's the genomic um, breeding value. The DGV is a direct genomic value. 
Um, below that, all of you know that the exterior of the heifer um, is the same like by the sires, the bulls you have. Um, on the right hand, the R3E. And over that, uh, on the yeah, on the right hand side, below the pedigree, are the functional traits and the MIG traits. Um, so, but you have all these data, and it's quite confusing for everyone to have such an amount of data. And yeah, how do you use them? First, it's quite important to set your strategy, uh, strategy and to have a target where you want to improve. For example, the um, Luisa will tell us a bit about their strategy um, afterwards and what their targets will be on the breeding side. Um, yeah, after that, the appraisal requirement, how many calves you need for, the, uh, for your replacement. So your raising strategy, what are the main uh, marketing strategy do you have to select on a kappa casein or a beta casein? Um, yeah, you, you will definitely have to look at that. You see as a, which calf has A2, A2 for better casein, and you can select on that. Otherwise, saying the heifers, they, they are not A2, A2, for example. So it's all up to you where you want to select your strategy. And yeah, afterwards, yeah, what I said, the breeding strategy. To which ball and what will be your... Uh, you heard in the future, you have to, you can breed on that um, on every single cow. So yeah, get excited on that. Um, it's exciting me every time. So to be on detail with every cow, to look at every cow and yeah, do the best for your herd at all. Um, here you can see um, the success story of herd genotyping. Um, this is the amount of herd genotyping farms after um, or it's not the herd genotyping farms, these are the cow vision um, farms. This is a sample where we gain through all, all, all the data for health traits and calf traits from all these farms. They have an average around 300 cows, so um, that you get a rough number for you. Uh, otherwise, Jana will tell you in the chat function which amount of herd genotype cows and heifers we already have in Germany. How many animals we yeah, genotyped. Uh, now, what's the procedure? How you get the genotype in your herd? Um, first, you start with a sampling of your heifer, I already said. Um, afterwards, sending it by mail um, to, uh, to us or to um, the IFN and Shonru, that's the testing station. They are isolating the DNA out of your sample. And yeah, doing the T uh, SMP typization, sending this data and to the YET, and they are processing the data to all, all breeding values for you. And yeah, afterwards, we send you the results of uh, genotyping to you or to your local distributor, and he is sending that to you. Um, now we will uh, we'll see um, yeah, how we, how you do the, um, yeah, take in the ear tag and it's quite easy. You don't have to worry that's uh, any difficult. Um, my colleague Bear Raupas will show you in the video how he is yeah, taking the ear tag sample.
Yeah, like you see, have seen in the video, it's quite easy to take the ear tag sample. Um, we at home as well, we, ha uh, we are using her genotyping um, to select our heifers. Uh, I'm from a small family farm as well. Um, it's, Luisa comes from a big, big, big family farm for German, uh, in Germany. So that's, we have around 30 heifers. So that's the difference between small and big here. And uh, yeah, like you have seen, it's quite easy to take the ear tag sample of the calves and send that back to us or just take a bigger amount of ear tags. Um, yeah. Now we want to come um, to what we get from all of that, the comparison between phenotype and genotype. That's what's already me interesting the most. It's why is it the same, the genotype and the phenotype? It's quite different for a breeder sometimes to, that you are not quite sure and don't trust every time the data. For me, it was, yeah, confusing that everything is matching. So it's, I didn't expect that in the first moment when I did it the first time, looking straight at that, the difference between uh, genotype and phenotype and that there's no difference. So that's nearly the same. And I will show you that in the next slides. Um, first, we come to this comparison of um, on the, yeah, Schuttenhof of the family Buckhaus and the comparison between the genomic breeding value um, and the phenotype breeding value for milk production. Um, on the left side, you see um, yeah, the genomic breeding value for, bre uh, for milk production. And on the right hand side, the phenotypical yeah, milk production in, yeah, in kilograms for the first lactating cows. The green line shows you um, yeah, the milk production and the gray, um, yeah, box, uh, I, I miss a word, um, shows you yeah, the spreading of the cows, which are in the lower G, uh, genomic breeding value, um, or on the left-hand side, the lower genomic breeding value. In the middle is yeah, 25 to 95%, then 50 to 74%. They're already getting up to 9,633 kilograms in an average of that group. And on the right-hand side, is the top one. This is the best for the breeding value for milk production. They have up to 10,781 kilograms. It's not getting up. That's, that's the average of this group of the best 25% uh, for genomic breeding value at the Buckhaus family. And you have to look at that. That's, you can earn money through that, selecting on yeah, milk production or other trades so that you can see, uh, see the difference. These are nearly 3,000 kilograms. And yeah, yeah. If there are any questions to that, just write it down in the chat. And uh, for me, it's yeah, definitely a reason to use her genotyping. Um, now we come to the exterior and to the cows on the single cow. First example here is the cow Fatima. Um, I've been that day with on the family farm of buck cows, um, yeah, clipping the arrows, getting the cows ready for, for you and have a better view on, on all the cows. Um, this cow is quite huge. I was saying right be, uh, beside her and she, she was get, getting me nearly up here and she was a huge cow, um, sire by Missan. And here you can see the stature 127. Um, when I say she goes meter here, um, for everybody that don't know me, I'm nearly two meters high. So that's quite a big cow. And yeah, um, furthermore, the rear uh, other high is yeah, 113, four other attachment, 123, rear other leg side view, 92. Uh, you will see in the video, the cow moving a bit and have a look on all the details I show you. Right now, first take a look at the milk production. Her milk production are 57.7 kilograms of milk by a fat percentage of 3.75 and 3.17 protein. And you can see here in the pedigree under milk uh, mother that's down, uh, upper of the exterior, she has an average, uh, no, she has up, not an average, but she has a genomic breeding value for plus 679 kilograms. Um, 
Now look at the video at this cow. She's the farmer's favorite. That's the cow we want. A good front udder, a huge rear udder, lots of milk, good feet and legs. And yeah, it's already one of the uh, favorite cows of Luisa's father. And I love this cow. Look at her udder, look at her legs. And even with robots, that's the cow you need in your barn. Um, our second cow, um, it's a young cow. They are breeding usually young cows. Um, to sex seam as well. This cow is a um, silver daughter, and one of if one of many at Buckhaus families. They nearly have twenty silver daughters making right now, and more are coming. So, so this is one of the first ones um, you you will see here. Her rump angle was ninety three is a little bit higher, but you can see here in the picture already it's not significantly high. So one standard deviation of is usually 12, and this is a half standard deviation. So with 93, so 100 minus 6, or here minus 7 is not much. So it's have not the biggest influence on her on the rump angle. Against the Sager 118, this is a cow she calved with 23 months. So you can see she will grow again and or fur furthermore, so it, she will be a huge cow as well. For her front udder attachment, 112. You see here the udder is going straight in the body. And yeah, the milk production here. Um, have a look at, at this. That's the one um, slide you will get from us of to all your cows. Um, here you can see the same, like. So all the numbers you, we have on the left, you can see in here and look at that. If they are the same, they are the same and the cow is looking great and good, uh, great, good. And yeah, it brings all with that what you need. So that's the reason why they are breeding her um, to sex seam again. Yeah, it was one of my favorite young cows in the barn. The legs are a little bit straighter, but it's yeah, n n nothing bad. So it stays in the balance. Um, yeah, coming further to our last cow. That's an example. Um, the Buckhaus family is breeding to beef. So you can see the rear attachment is not such as high as uh, with 84. It could be higher. So that's the reason they don't want to breed her back to Holstein. Um, and selecting, okay, she definitely needs to be to brief, uh, beef. Uh, yeah, the rear leg cycle with 83 has a little bit too much angle for them. Oh, it's too straight, sorry. Um, uh, it's too straight. The front other attachment as well is too loose for, for further calves. She just had her second calf right now. Uh, her fat percentages as well are too low. You can see it in here. Her fat is yeah, minus three, uh, zero, three, four. It's a little bit small here. You see it upper the exterior. It's the second line. It's Fettgehalt written in Germany. Um, and there you can see it's minus zero, three, four. And yeah, we definitely need the, the good fat percentage. You will earn more money with better fat percentages in Germany and other countries as well. And now should start the video to her. Um, yeah, she is a cow. You like, you can still milk her. She's good, but the, the cows, you, uh, yeah, Luisa's father caught, uh, caught likes are the first ones, like the Missan, and uh, with a tight udder, that's the reason they are breeding her to beef. Um, now we're coming to uh, Luisa's part. She will tell us a little bit more about her, uh, their breeding strategy. And I would you mind passing the pointer to her? Thank you. Yeah, Luisa, tell us a bit about your breeding strategy, what or mainly your father is doing um, and selecting the cows. Yeah, I try to do that. Here you can see a little video first where we are in our barn and looking at some of our cows. And what we always do is look at the genotype, but then look at the phenotype. My father is still training me because I've got a lot to learn. 
and then we look at each cow individually. Here you can see the first calf heifers of the sire Silvert. They are all from him and uh, they are really nice in the parlor and have good milky yields. So we used this sire quite a lot and maybe we're going to reuse him. The heifer that you saw in the video at the beginning, uh, maybe so you can put it in comparison. She was just about three or four weeks uh, after calving when that video was taken. So um, this little bit fat udder just went back and it's more clean and you can see the veins even better at the moment. Here you can see my father and our breeding profession helper, I don't know the English name for that, I'm working, I'm walking into our parlor and then into our office and we always talk to someone from Masterind to talk about the sires that we want to use and there we uh, do that whenever a new genotype and new numbers come out and there you can see how they look and compare and see what is important for our herd and so they decide which size we use and then we all put it through a BAP system so for every cow we get a selection of three sires which they think would be best on our cows but because my father is such a breeder he sometimes varies a little bit from that and makes his own decisions. Yeah, our way to her genotyping in 2011, when we started to build the first new barn, it was also a decision if we wanted to continue farming, because in Germany there are lots of restrictions and lots of rules when you want to be a farmer and especially a dairy farmer. The amount of cows you can have always is related and restricted to the amount of land you have. So at the moment, we don't have enough land to build a new barn and have more cows. We just can stay at the number that we have at the moment. And when we decided to grow our farm, we did that due to a few reasons, but the two main reasons were that on the one hand, we wanted to put our dry cows in a good and yeah, hopefully perfect environment. You always aim for that. And uh, because we wanted to, to do that, we needed money, obviously, to build a barn. And that is quite expensive in Germany. And there are rules that you have to have silos for the feed with a drainage system and you have silos for the manure and lots of lots of restrictions. And because of that, we had to put in I can tell you that about half a million euros just for, to meet these restrictions. And so we had to put uh, more milking cows in our barn as well. And when it was clear that we were going from 200 to 600 cows in a time, a period of three months, which was quite a huge step, we had to think of how we're going to do it and what can we do to make sure our cows stay healthy and have a good milk yield. And one of these uh, steps in that was to start with the herd genotyping. And we, so we know what we have, which level we have, and know where to be better and how to improve our herd. And that's a still ongoing path. So we always uh, wanna be better and we're gonna continue herd genotyping and improve our herd average. Our main target, why we breed, is to extend the longevity of our cows. So that is the overall goal. We like old cows. You saw that in the first introduction video. There were papers on the wall. And there you see saw all our cows that reached uh, 100,000 kilograms of milk since we were in the, new uh, in the new shed. And yeah, we're always really proud when a cow reaches that number. And you can only do that when you um, breed with a clear view and when you set your goals right. And to extend the longevity, 
we think it's really important to um, uh, increase the reproduction numbers and to have really fertile cows and to have a really low somatic cell score um, because all these health numbers make sure that your cow can stay in your herd really lo uh, long. You of course need a good type so they can walk in your barn and drink and uh, eat enough so they give lots of milk. And what is quite important for us too is a good milking speed, which is sometimes a little bit difficult with the low somatic cell score, but we think it's quite important for us to have a good working routine in the parlor especially and have all the cows milked out fast. So we don't waste too much time waiting for one cow which doesn't finish milking. So um, again, what were our questions before we uh, improved or we grew from 200 cows to 600 cows? We of course, wanted to know which genomic level do we have at the moment? What do our heifers have? And how can we optimize our selection and breeding strategy? We needed to do that, not just because of breeding um, love, I say, what my father has, but because we have limited factors, just like the arable land that we have, like space for young stock, because we didn't grow that part on our farm. And we had to think of ways to easily communicate that and ways to have healthy cows and cows which are easy to work with because when you have employees, it's always uh, important that they can have a good workflow. And because workers are really, really expensive in Germany, it's important that they can work effectively so you don't spend too much money on that. The starting situation when we had about 200 cows was that we were bringing most of our cows to conventional semen from Holstein bulls. We used a little bit of um, beef breads on that time, mostly Belgian blue. We tried out Ukamerka, we tried out Limousin, um, but we stick with Belgian blue at the end. I think we can do that because we have quite big cows and when we use Belgian blue bulls, we always look if they are easy calving and you know, we have just good results with Belgian blues and they pay a lot more when we sell them to the next farm. Uh, at the moment, we have about 40% of beef breeds on our cows and we mo use, mostly use Belgian blue but uh, yeah, a little bit we reuse INRA as well, especially for our really small cows because they are really easy calving. And you saw them in the introduction video, they're really nice just from the look. And we use some sex uh, semen as well, mostly on our heifers, but on some of the really fertile and really good cows, um, we use them on the more calving cows as well. And what we, uh, what we started about a year, a year and a half ago, is that we only use A2, A2 sires. So that's like a basic standard. We don't use any others. So we can change our herd just through time. So we get ready for new markets that may come in Germany. Now, Jan is going to show you what happened on our farm since we started with uh, genomic genotyping. When we started in 2018, we uh, tested the whole year, the whole heifers of 2017 as well. So you see them in the chart too. Yeah, 2018, um, yeah, the family started with her genotyping and here you can see the improvement they had after the first year they breed 2018 all on the herd genotypes and you see the result in 2020 with a huge step from an average RCG of 116 that was a little bit under the project average. The project here is the um, cow vision project and now they are over the average through the selecting and selecting the bulls right and setting the targets 
they're getting over the project average of uh, or cow vision project now to an yeah average g answer g of 129 and yeah this year they are going up to 132 a little bit higher again and this have been all the heifers tested till march 2021 so this year um in the next slide here we see a huger step uh, in the outside euro that's our new breeding value and here you see yeah they improved around 400 euro on one animal at the uh, GRZ euro in the average have been 2018 a little bit higher than the average of the project and yeah this this year and last year you have the huge step around 400 500 euro or in the uh, yeah genomic points and the total merit index GRZ euro so yeah you can see the influence and even the step you will see in the future of the farm we ho hope and we we already think that we will see the improvement of the herd genotypes and the production and yeah you can see the potential the potential that brings the genomic breeding value it shows the potential of each animal and yeah through the environment the good environment they expanded on the backhouse farm they have the next step to to use the whole genomic yeah the potential the whole genomic potential of any of every animal in the phenotype before we go ahead jan there's a question coming in and i will forward this to luisa because uh, it just refers to this slide and the question is why there is such a big step in the other G from 2019 to 2020. Okay, I try to answer that. Um, I think it's because you can say like the genotyping is clicking in and yeah, we were able to breed even more strict. And so we can improve the herd quite faster. So it, with each year you do it, it gets better. And yeah, I think it's now going to be as steep for the next year too. And maybe it's going to be a little bit lower in 20. Oh no, no, no. Yeah, that's it. Maybe you want to say something to that, Jan? Uh, yeah, I can say something maybe, but um, yeah. You stay with, with a you can see the whole line of the whole project it's going a little bit up that's um yeah used to be normal for a project like that everybody's usually uh, using her genotyping and breeding more accurately on each heifer and each animal so through that that you can have an influence on the good and on the bad um, side of each animal so you you are able to use sires with they have smaller problems or so and use that on any on heifers or, or cows they have they don't have that problem for example having not so much milk and but good fat and protein percentage you can use a sire with lots of milk and lower fat and protein percentage and you might get an average between both of that but it's not you can say that from breeding that you that will be your um, calf it will be yeah you have, can have a possibility through all of that through the mating of which LL is matching together. And yeah, it's, but you have the opportunity to get the next great heifer in your barn. And that should be it from my side. I think Jan, you have some more slides uh, for us prepared. Um, I just want to mention that there's a couple of questions that is waiting to be answered, but I decided to uh, collect them to answer them all in all uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, we will be with you and the answers soon. Okay, so let's come to the answer then. That's our total merit index for um, longevity. Um, you can see here on, on the Backhouse family, on the, their farm, and in the project that there's a yeah, really slower improvement on the longevity because it's that's a total merit index influenced by many other me, uh, total merits for example somatic cell score pro, uh, reproduction and production as well so there's big influence and changing they have, also things they have an 
influence on the longevity that the long term merit um, they want to improve. And I really can understand that a cow you can use for more years, that's a more profitable cow. And that's a cow you need to earn money on your farm because growing heifers, raising heifers stays expensive and will be expensive in the future as well. On the next side, you see um, the next step of the improvement and the targets. Um, they are coming the upcoming years. It's a backhouse family. So Luisa, you might want to say something um, to the things you are improving the next years on your farm. Yeah, I can do that. Um, we always divide our goals in smaller and short-term goals and bigger long-term goals. And one of our next steps is going to be to improve our calf fitness or the environment for our calves and, and even increase the working area for people working there because uh, at the moment that's not, not how we like it to be. And we have this big overall goal to increase the lifetime production. We want to be over... 40,000 kilogram and yeah I think and I hope we will reach that this or next year and for doing that it's always important to improve the health, uh, herd health which I said before it's somatic cell score and reproduction numbers that we look on and which we breed for and through that on the journey the genomic level of our animals going is going to improve too. Yeah, uh, before I answer all your questions, I would like to invite you to come and visit our farm in person as soon as that's possible. We are really close to Hanover, so whenever you plan to go to Agritechnica or Eurotia in the future, we are just a 20 minute drive away. And we always like to talk to foreign, foreign farmers and to meet you. So feel free to contact Masterind or us directly and visit our farm. Thank you, Luisa, for this great, great overview. And yes, let's go into the question, uh, into the questions. And um, Diana, I need your help now. I will uh, start with a few questions, and at the end, I will uh, um, ask you if I forgot some. So please follow up with me on that. The first question is uh, for the beef on dairy topic um, that Luisa already touched a little bit, and it is about uh, what breeds are you using and why you use them. Yeah, we, as I said, we use mostly Belgian blue and a little bit of Inra. And we do that because um, the German market, Belgian blue sells really good. And we get, yeah, good money for that. And on our farm, we don't have any problems with carving. So it's good and easy carving. And Inra we use for the smaller cows. Yeah. Is that okay? Is that enough? Yes, I think so. Otherwise, we will hear it right now through the audience. Um, there's, uh, there are a couple of questions about uh, the bulls you used um, in the past and now. So the first question is, um, how much genomic bulls are you using? Only genomic bulls. Only genomic bulls. Okay. so that's They have very... to be genomically tested. All right. A very fast answer. Uh, the second question is if you're using uh, if you're using only German bulls or also foreign genetic and uh, if yes from where? Mm -hmm. That's a really difficult question for me. I know that we use mostly in a very 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 high percentage um, bulls that we get through Masterland. I think they are mostly German bulls. Uh, yes, sometimes my father has some special bulls, but to be honest, I can't tell you. I can tell you which size we use at the moment, and then you can look up if they are German or not. <laughs> That's a very polite answer for our international genetic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's another question here. Um, are you selecting strictly for the GEBY longevity? Or do you try to reach that by indir indirect selection, for example, for confirmation? 
Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what the word confirmation means, but um, we always have a mixture when we breed. So the overall goal is longevity, but we don't breed strictly on that. We always look at the whole animal and we look at the family of the animal too and how they bred. So when we have a cow and she ha already has three calves, we look um, how the genetics of the three calves are and how she's breeding. And then we always make a mix of all these factors. And for example, uh, the single numbers for reproduction, for fertility or for, for somatic cells are a little bit more important, but um, yeah, I think we get longevity through that as well. Okay, very good. And then we have a question concerning the calving interval. So um, what do you think about the general topic of prolonging or prolonging calving interval uh, with 393 days you have with such a high uh, lactation uh, level or lactating level? Do you think this is well or suits well or what do you think about this topic in general? Yeah, that's something we uh, discuss uh, back home and we already tried to extend uh, the time between two carvings and with some cows that works quite well but I think it just works when you know every cow by heart and you know how persistent she is. And when you want to manage a larger amount of cows, and I think most farms out there are going to be much bigger than ours, uh, it's really important that you have a strict uh, scheme that you can work on. And if you want to have high milk yields, you always have to have a short time, like 393 days, a, 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 a below 400 is really important and that's what we aim for and for us yeah if you want to have high milking numbers you have to have a herd which doesn't have much days in milk we want to be a little bit better there we aim for 165 around that because each day that they are later in lactation it just costs you milk but because my father is so much into all this breeding, we have single cows where we know they have a super high persistency where we uh, breed later and where we do that on purpose. But for most of the cows, it's good to breed fast and have short time between carvings. Okay. Now I have a compliment from a gentleman. I, I, <laughs> I just read the, the words here directly from his message. Um, thanks, Luisa, for this opportunity. Wishing you more and more success. Um, I have a question about the longevity, he writes. And uh, what percentage of herd is old cows? What do you mean with old cows? So by what age is an old cow or lactation is an old cow an old cow? And... Um, yeah, what, what does this mean that what does this mean for you and the farm? Yeah, I try to answer that because that's a few questions. If I forget one, just remind me. Um, at the moment, we have not what we 100% aim for because it, just three years ago, we put in 400 new cows at one in one a short time in our shed. So after that, we had quite a young herd for two years because we put in mostly heifers. And now we are close to being back to normal and have most of the cows in the second and third lactation. And I'd like to have more cows in fourth and fifth lactation. Yeah, I, I, I like old cows. I love working with them. And yeah, we, we aim to have 100,000 liter cows, but not, not on without compromising. So when a cow can't do it, she can't do it. And then you have to see that. That's why we're breeding to make all cows better and make the herd better. And yeah, so I would think when my, our overall goal would be that a cow does four, maybe five lactations, that would be great on average, but that's going to take a few years. 
Lisa, you were just talking about goals. Uh, I have mm -hmm. a question that's also related to that. I, I just signed it down here. If you would have one wish to improve your herd, what would be your goal? So then you can, now you can tell everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one wish would be, of course, healthy cows, but the fertility. If that is good, then everything's easy. And if we would have, or if you could have, in a big wish, perfect fertility, I would probably wait a little bit longer for the first insemination because um, when you know your first shot is uh, the perfect shot and she's pregnant, you can start a little bit later. Yeah, that would be a big wish. That would be perfect. Less work, more ha healthy and happy cows. And then you have happy stuff and happy family. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually a good closing word, but there's another question that I would um, give to you. Um, the level of your farm you have in general, um, how would you evaluate this in comparison to other farms, uh, milking produ milk producing farms in Germany? Yeah, I think we are maybe at the best 25, maybe best 10%. I didn't look that up really, but we're somewhere there and yeah, we want to be the best. That's always the goal. But I think to be in the best 10%, that's, that's a good goal. When we can go there, stay there, that would be good. But it's not just milk yield that is important for us. Uh, the most important part is to have healthy cows. Because when you have healthy cows, you can't stop the milk. Cows that are happy and healthy, they just give milk. So it's pretty easy when you have healthy cows, you have lots of milk. That's true. And I'm sure you will uh, confirm that in the number of cows, it's not everything. So also the management and how you uh, deal with everything. And uh, there's one question related to restrictions. So uh, the restrictions that we face here in Germany um, as a farmer or milking farmer in general, how do you deal with this? Um, did you have problems to grow in the past up to that herd size that you have? Uh, what what can you tell us about that? I think this is also the last question I can forward to you. Otherwise, Diana found some in the chat. Then please uh, advise to me. Okay. Yeah. As I shortly said before, the restrictions in Germany are crazy high. I think um, we have lots of them, not just for the animals, but for the whole environment as well. So for the whole society, it's really important. And that's the main focus in Germany at the moment. And politicians discuss it all the time, is how can we save our nature? How can we save the environment? And that is something every culture is just putting under. And you can't do what you want. And we have this big discussion about animal welfare as well. So so um, when we wanted to build our new shed, we had to go through a very long process. I think from the first thoughts of how we want to do it to when the barn was finished, it was three years. And it's quite normal in Germany to take one year or two years to just get a permission to start building. So you have to prepare that quite good and then bring it to the politicians so they can say okay you have the goal for building and you have to make yeah like something good on nature you have to build uh, to plant trees you have to stop working on some fields and yeah that's crazy high in Germany and as I said before you have to build all the silos with a water system so the water doesn't uh, flow away and yeah, it's really, really big in Germany. I think it's good to uh, protect the environment, but yeah, we produce at a very high cost. And so in Germany, we don't have any choice but have high milk yields if we want to be a dairy farm in the future. Ah, I'm much. Um, because uh, I was reading the question about the bulls that we were using 2018. And at the moment, I just texted my father shortly and he replied. So I can tell you now, because uh, 2018, I don't know. But he said in that year, we mostly used Barnesto, Mirandi, McCoy, 
Um, these were the ones we used the most. And at the moment, we use Sportsman, Complex, Hurricane, Bambo, and Babylon. I hope that was okay. Yes, I think so. I think this also answers the question about if only the highest genomic bulls are used or not, because you already gave a little overview which bulls you use. And I would like to forward um, one compliment uh, also from the North Europe country. Um, and uh, I would like to let the audience participate in that. So very interesting masterclass event. Thank you very much to Luisa and good luck to you and your family. It's very impressive to see you as a young enthusiastic farmer who is so well informed, keen and professional, keen and professional in farming. So that was actually my closing word. Thank you. <laughs> what, what shall I say now more? I can say thank you. I can say uh, thank you to you as our speaker, to you, to you Jan as well as our speaker and to you, uh, our audience. Uh, so high interested audience. So in case there are more questions, please, put them here in the chat and we try to answer them also um, one, two, three minutes after our uh, masterclass ended. Yeah, thanks to um, the Schüttenhof team of the farm that they opened the door for us and Luisa that you joined a masterclass um, a second time because you were in the German webinar version last week already and uh, this was also a really great success. So yeah, thank you that you uh, joined this time here as well. We also would like to know how you as our um, listeners and um, audience uh, liked our masterclass today. Um, so our colleague will put the poll in here. Please give us a comment on that and uh, Jan will share the presentation again because we would like to let you know what we will have in the next program for you in our masterclass row. So now we get a little confused because <laughs> we have a mixture of the poll and the mixture of the slide. So I hope you can see the poll still to take uh, your time for the answer. And um, in the meanwhile, let me introduce you to the next dates. We have um, two master classes in June and uh, sorry, in April. We have two in May and we have one in June. So those in May we skipped here. But to give you a short um, overview of what will happen in April, uh, April 15th, uh, we will have a masterclass, about, a masterclass about the news from the April proof run with uh, Dr. Stefan Rensing. Um, those who uh, are with us uh, for a certain time know our expert from the VIT uh, data. Um, um, so now I missed the word. Uh, from the VIT. <laughs> Those who are in, they know that. So uh, Stefan is also part of the discussion here today. Um, I really appreciate to see you soon here uh, towards our audience. And then we will have one week later a progeny presentation, which was originally also planned or was always planned for the Schauderbesten. And uh, now we also try to put this point of, um, on our agenda on the digital way. So yeah, you can be excited to learn what we have there for you. Yeah, that's for the moment. Second bull parade will um, will be done in June. For those who joined us three weeks ago, they know already um, what they can expect. And yeah, I think that's for the moment. Uh, the pool is done. I said thank you to all of you. Uh, you know the next dates. Uh, we will shorten the time until we can meet again in presence and stay healthy, stay optimistic. We will go through this time and uh, stick together and yeah, hope to see you soon. Best wishes from here. Bye bye. See you soon. Have a good day. <laughs>